Hi everyone. Um, welcome to this session about hacking HTTP2 and new attacks on the Internet Next Generation Foundation. It's been a great day so far. I hope you enjoy this session. Um, first thing first, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is uh, Nadava Vital. I'm the application security research team leader in Imperva uh, with uh, more than 10 years of industry experience mostly in hacking, uh, web technologies, uh, security technologies. I hold a BSc in computer science and uh, two things about myself as you are about to see. I love experimenting with new technology and I love to break stuff. Okay, some credit to the guys that participated in this uh, research. Noah Mazor, former application security researcher in my team and two students, Alex Maidanik and Avichai Cohen from the Technion Israeli Institute of Technology. So today I'm going to cover um, uh, some uh, background and motivation to HTTP2 protocol. And uh, then I'm going to explain a bit about the technology. I'm going to move on to the exciting part of the session is uh, new attacks and conclude with a summary and takeaways. So why do we need a new protocol for the internet? Um, the problem with HTTP1 is, it, is that it is no longer suitable for modern web content. In this example, um, uh, we can see a single request to the imperva.com site that is followed by 123 subsequent requests to all sort of web resources uh, with a total 2 megabytes of data being transmitted and 12 seconds loading time. So we have uh, numerous problems with uh, HTTP 1. We have a large number of web resources uh, per page, uh, latency, head of the line, and uh, redundant information that is being sent over and over through the HTTP request headers. Uh, so who uses this uh, new protocol? Uh, already today we see that major browsers, web servers, uh, sites and content delivery network already support uh, this uh, new protocol. So uh, it's fairly common. I'm going to dive uh, just a description about the technology in order for us to understand the attacks that are going to follow. So HTTP technology can be roughly be divided uh, into four components. First, the stream multiplexing, which allows multiple HTTP2 streams over a single TCP connection. We have a flow control which allows the connection participant to limit the amount and the timing of the data over the connection. We have header, header compression uh, to compress uh, the information that is being sent in the headers and server push mechanism that allows the server to push web resources to the clients even before they ask it. Now the smallest data delivery unit is called a frame. Frame is actually a binary object that can contain headers, uh, data, settings and more. A stream is composed of multiple frames and it represents a request and response duo. An HTTP2 connection is, uh, uh, is uh, composed from multiple streams that are transmitted over a single TCP connection. Okay, so after we understand uh, why we need this new protocol and uh, how it works, it's time to see new attacks. So in our research, we uh, tested five major web servers uh, that count for the most uh, most of the internet's traffic according to Netcraft statistics. We tested the uh, Apache server, uh, Windows IIS, Nginx, and uh, two more implementation of uh, NG uh, two more implementation of HTTP. Two is uh, NG HTTP2 and Jetty server written in Java. So we developed four different denial of service attacks based on zero day vulnerabilities. All vulnerabilities um, uh, are new and we found as part of our research uh, effort to estimate the security posture of servers in server implementation of this new protocol. All the CVEs were created by Imperva and were reported to the relevant vendors. Also, we worked together with the vendors in order to create the proper security solutions which are now uh, available through public uh, security patches. So the first vulnerability is in the flow control mechanism. The flow control mechanism allows each endpoint in the in the connection to limit the amount of data that will be transmitted over the connection. And 
since it is mandatory by the protocol, servers that get uh, such requests from uh, clients must follow uh, the request. And when we heard about this uh, uh, new data control mechanism, we immedi immediately thought about data rate uh, attacks. So we implemented a new low data rate attack to achieve a denial of service. And in fact, we reached the same effect of the famous slow loris attack over a single HTTP2 connection. So in this attack, first the attacker needs to open an HTTP connection and reduce the initial window size. Then the attacker sends a request for a large resource, bigger than the window size. And when Jetty Server, for example, gets the request for a resource that is larger than the window size, the thread that handles the request goes to sleep for 30 seconds. In other servers like Apache or IIS, the attacker needs to keep the connection alive, and you can do that by slowly increasing the window size. And by sending a multiple request, the attacker can actually make all the threads that handle uh, the, the request go to sleep and achieve a denial of service. And as I mentioned, all of that is done through a single HTTP2 connection. So we have a uh, video, uh, uh, video demo. We have uh, three players. In this video, we have the Jetty server. Uh, we have a control client uh, written in Python to send and receive responses from the server. And we have the attacker. Now the attacker launches the attack. And a few seconds afterwards, we can see that the control client stops receiving normal responses, uh, gets uh, all kind of errors. And then the attacker stops the attack. And after a few seconds, we can see that the server slowly begins to recover. And the control client will resume receiving the normal responses. Okay, moving on to the second vulnerability. Uh, the second vulnerability is in the stream multiplexing mechanism. So multiplexing addresses uh, the latency and head of the line problems by allowing multiple requests and response uh, at the same time over a single connection. However, the partition of the TCP connection is purely logical. And as such, it can be manipulated by an attacker to send frames and, s and uh, streams out of context. So the attack flow is very, very simple. In fact, it's sadly simple. And in this uh, uh, attack, the attacker opens an HTTP connection and sends two requests on a single stream. So in this case, uh, we tested the Windows IIS server. And uh, not only did the IIS server crash, we also got a blue screen of death. Yep. <laughs> and of course, denial of service. So here's the demo. We've got an IIS uh, server running on top of uh, Windows 10. Uh, we've got a browser, which is our control client. And we've got the attacker. And the attack is very short. And as you can see, the screen of death. Now the third uh, vulnerability is in the header compression mechanism. Uh, the header compression mechanism reduces the bandwidth by compressing HTTP2 headers. And in this mechanism, both sides, client and server, uh, maintain a header table per, t per TCP connection direction. We have one table for incoming requests and another table for outgoing responses. And this table consists of dynamic part and static part. And uh, the client and the server use these tables in order to, as dictionaries, in order to compress and decompress the headers. So for example, we have, uh, on the left, we have a full representation of the request headers. And on the right, we have the compressed representation for the same headers using the compression table uh, in the middle. So we can see that for some of the headers, for example, the get method uh, header, uh, we have a single byte re reference representation in the compressed uh, table, in the compressed representation. So in this attack uh, that we called uh, an H 
HPAC bomb. HPAC is the uh, the algorithm uh, for the compression. We abuse the compression mechanism in order to inflate the server memory by a factor of 4,000. So the attacker opens a connection and first inserts a long header to the dynamic table. We call it header X. Then the attacker sends a request with thousands of references to this header. And by doing so, by, by doing so, it inflates the server memory. We have on the attacker side a uh, 16 kilobyte of memory that it needs to invest in the in this request and it decompresses in the service on the server side to 64 megabytes. So by sending 14 compressed frames we were able to crash the server. So this is the the math. Uh, we have uh, the default size of the dynamic table is uh, 4 kilobytes and uh, one request can contain 16 kilobyte of headers. Now reference the as you as you uh, previously saw reference it can take one byte so we can actually send 16 kilobyte of references. That means that the single request can be decompressed into 64 megabytes. And 14 requests requests will decompress into 896 megabytes which was which was enough in our case to crash the NGHTTP server. So in this example we have the NGHTTP server and we monitor the server CPU and memory consumption. And we have the attacker that launches the HPAC bomb attack. And we can see that the memory and CPU consumption spike. Uh, the attacker keeps sending the compressed frames. At this point the system monitoring uh, halts. And uh, after a few seconds uh, we'll see that the attacker uh, uh, gets a uh, failure response from the server and the monitoring uh, we see that the server process dies with uh, segmentation fault. So here is a funny here is a funny story. Uh NGHTTP2 project also supplies a standalone uh, libraries uh, that are used in other products. For example, in Wireshark. So when we uh, developed this attack and uh, wanted to report it to the to the vendor and send a uh, network traffic uh, a pickup file. And uh, so we recorded the, the the attack and we played it in uh, Wireshark and what we uh, saw and were very surprised to see that the Wireshark has the same vulnerability uh, since it uses the library, the standalone library that that is vulnerable. So uh, we saw all these attacks and the questions that comes uh, to mind is what can we do? So we have three options. Uh, first one is just to say, you know, forget about it. Let's let's just abandon the, the plans for HTTP2. But HTTP2 is the next generation protocol for the internet, and it solves a lot of real pro problems in HTTP1. Also, we have a dozen of other vulnerabilities that are published every month or every day for non-HTTP2 servers. So this option is off the table. So uh, we can also choose a secure server implementation but in our research we found that no such server exists. So all the servers that we tested were found vulnerable for at least one of the attacks. And what about third party uh, software? Uh, as, as we saw in the example of Wireshark perhaps the Server implementation is secure, but third party software that, that are on the server are not secured. And even if you can find a secure server implementation, more vulnerabilities uh, are going to come. And in fact, since the time that we published the report, dozens of more uh, vulnerabilities in HTTP2 were discovered and reported. So we are left uh, with uh, uh, the third option, uh, which is to patch. And when you patch, you need to build a patching framework. And when building a patching framework you need to ask a lot of difficult questions that some have answers, some may not have answers. Uh, questions like how do you know that a vulnerability exists? Uh, when will the patch be ready? Uh, what's the impact of the patch? Uh, is it stable? So sometimes vendors are rushing into things and publish uh, uh, security patches in order to satisfy a customer's uh, demands without properly checking them. 
So let's look at the, another approach where the application is equipped with a web application and firewall with uh, virtual patching. So the traffic uh, is monitored by the web application firewall which can be either on premise or in the cloud. And when a security flow is detected is uh, is uh, found in the web server, uh, virtual patching is deployed in the web application firewall and stopping attacks at the web application firewall instead of the server. So the server remains intact uh, and protected. No need to change anything in the server. Um and the uh, application owner can actually focus on business instead of focusing on building a patching framework and answering all these uh, annoying questions. So the the key takeaways uh, from this uh, session. HTTP2 is great. It is here to stay and rightfully so. Uh, but it also extends the attack surface for web attackers. We have new and highly cus customizable uh, transport uh, mechanism, a new amount of code that was released in a short amount of time, and we need to remember that HTTP2 is still uncharted territory. So, um, and HTTP2 ecosystem is still not security mature, unlike HTTP1, which is with us for 20 or 30 years. Right, so we have a lot of uh, uh, researchers, we have a lot of uh, uh, implementations that are fairly secure. And things may even, for HTTP, H for HTTP2, things may even get uh, worse when uh, uh, servers and sites uh, will start utilizing the full capabilities of this uh, new protocol. So right now, uh, uh, what we see is that uh, there is a, like a sort of a transition period. So, uh, Sites are using this protocol, but they are not fully uh, utilizing the capabilities. And the last key takeaway is that without an external protection and virtual patching, it's, it will be very difficult for uh, business uh, owners to win the patching race. So this was my last slide. If you want to read uh, more about the, uh, the technical details, uh, you can see you can get it in the following. Uh, uh, URL address where we publish the report and we have some time for questions so thank you. <laughs> yes. So yeah, uh, the question was if the in during our research if we found that the protocol is vulnerable or the uh, implementation. So our research was uh we concentrated our research at server implementations. Um Yep. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, so I was instructed um, not to uh, pitch any product. <laughs> um, uh, so um, no, we, we didn't test web application firewalls. We tested the uh, uh, web servers. Uh, um, but of course, if you want to choose a web application firewall, you should choose one that is capable of protecting from HTTP2 vulnerabilities. Yes. Uh, no, we did not publish uh, tools, but the attacks are very, very simple, and uh, the techn all the technical details are in the report. So it's uh, it's fairly simple to build the uh, to build the attacks. Uh, we did all all the attack were uh, created uh, with Python scripts. Yes.
So um, no, we did not test it. I, I know that was a discussion in uh, some of the communities uh, that uh, after we published the report, uh, people started asking questions, is Node.js vulnerable, yes or no? Um, I didn't follow up on that, um, but uh, the, the simple answer is that we didn't test those. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I got fully understand your question, but from uh, the question was um, some of the attacks may look like uh, normal. Tra so um, it's very hard for me to imagine that any of these attacks will come from legitimate clients. I mean, for uh, to create 16,000 uh, references uh, to to an entry that consume all of the uh, compression table is not something that you would normally see in uh, web traffic. Anyone else? Okay, thank you.